I told you the capacitors store energy, and we're gonna figure out exactly how much energy they store from first principles. It is extremely important that when you write this down, you always label it as the energy stored in a capacitor because it will not be the same result as the energy stored in some general charge configuration. In fact, it is contradictory and challenging. So this is the energy stored in a uh, parallel plate capacitor you know that we're going to have two plates and they will each have a certain area and there will be a separation between them and there will be an electric field in between them, probably pointing some direction. I don't even care which way it points. <clears throat> and uh, I guess there'll also be a charge on one plate, positive, and the opposite charge on the other plate if it's being used in a standard sort of configuration. So let's go to very first principles. We know that potential energy or work changing potential energy, if I, if I think about it like this, I wanna think about it as having two plates of metal that have no charge separated from each other by zero. So this is two plates of metal. Now let's say one of them has some positive charge and the other one has some negative charge. That's sort of um, a semantic argument really I think because they are on top of each other. So what does it mean that one has a positive charge and the other has a negative? Well, it means in this sense, I'm going to be pulling the negative away from the positive, or I don't care whether you want to pull the positive away from the negative, but each of these two planes of metal will be having some electric field, and it doesn't depend on distance, and so we'll separate them from each other, and we'll have to do work in order to separate them because they prefer to be attached to each other. So that's the way we're thinking about a capacitor. It's sort of inside the capacitor factory. We are screwing with the capacitance of our capacitors as we change this, but we're not gonna let that concern us. We're only gonna investigate the capacitance's effect on the energy once we've got the capacitor separated, and then we know it's energy. So we're gonna think more about charge and voltage a little bit. So you know that uh, work done is force integrated over distance. And we're gonna say that everything's in the right direction so we don't need to worry about this dot product right here. Now, electric force is charge times electric field, right? So let's see, the, we're gonna say charge times electric field and we're gonna integrate that over distance. We do more and more and more work as we continue separating those charges. And uh, I guess electric field's gonna be constant, so that's lovely, but we need to plug in something for or the charge that's in the uh, that's on the plates, and that may change with distance as we keep the uh, electric field the same within there. Uh, I don't know, maybe it will. But anyway, let's figure out what that charge could be. I know that the electric field caused by the charge is the total charge divided by epsilon naught times the area. And remember, this is just sigma divided by epsilon naught. That's why we're justified in doing that. So I'm going to plug this in right here, but the problem is that's the charge at, uh, oh gosh, let's solve this for charge. Sorry, I'm not plugging it in yet, don't be silly. Q is electric field times epsilon naught times area, and that's the final charge. So maybe the average charge will be divided by two, all right? So I'm gonna take this sucker and I'm going to, um, I'm gonna plug it into that equation right there. Let's see how it goes. And I'm going to, uh, this is sort of a way to skip doing the calculus. I'm going to make the calculus trivial after this step. It's going to be electric field squared. See, I've already got an electric field, and I'm plugging in another one right there, times epsilon naught times area divided by 2 over x. And none of these things depend on, depends on x. So I can pull them all out of the integral. So I get, I'm going to rearrange the order a little bit, epsilon naught times electric field squared times area divided by two times the integral of one over all x. And that's just going to give me this integral. Shoot, that's a simple integral. That just gives me the distance between the two plates because I've been separating the plates by that distance. All right, so our result then is that the energy stored in a capacitor is epsilon naught times the electric field between the plates square times the area of the plates times the distance separating the plates divided by two. And if I were to go back a little bit, I could remind you that the charge on a plate, not the average charge during this process, but the charge on a plate is, well, that's simply electric field times epsilon naught times area. And I also want to remind you that voltage is ed, maybe absolute value of voltage. And that means that this stuff, 
this stuff is actually just, well, I see, I see Q in here, epsilon naught, electric field, and area, and I see electric field times distance, and then the whole thing's divided by two. So this is the charge on the plate of a capacitor times the voltage between the two plates of the capacitor divided by two. So we could also write it, this is the standard way of writing it, one half Q times V. That's the energy stored in a capacitor. So let us get that equation up here where it's a little bit cleaner. U in a cap, me in a cap, what? One half Q times V. Now I remember that Q, we can change this in two ways. Q is equal to C times V, or we could also change it by using the equation V is equal to, well, it's gonna be the same equation, V is Q over C. And doing this gives us this equation, I'm gonna get, uh, oh man, I'm gonna get C and a V squared. So that says one half C V squared. That's a very useful way to look at the energy stored in a capacitor. It's the capacitance times the voltage on the capacitor squared. Oh, so if I double the voltage on a given capacitor, I'm storing four times as much energy. That's very powerful. So you want capacitors with high voltage ratings if you want to have a lot of energy stored in there. Uh, another way to look at the energy stored in a capacitor, this is probably, although the most easily derived way, probably not the most useful way to look at the equation. There's another useful way to look at it, and that's gonna give me a Q square, and then I'm gonna divide by two times the capacitance. Oh, shoot! Look at these apparently contradictory statements about the energy stored in a capacitor. This one says, if I increase the capacitance, I'll be storing more energy. This one seems to say, if I increase the capacitance, I'll be storing less energy. Whoa, you have to play with those in problems or they will make no sense to you. These contradictions always result from a misunderstanding about what's being held constant. So there are some situations in which you change the capacitance of a capacitor, and the classic way is to change the separation of the plates because you know the capacitance, what is this? capacitance is related to something like uh, epsilon naught area over the separation of the plates or something. <clears throat> or, I mean, heck, epsilon, if you're able to put a dialectic in there. So you're moving the plates and whether it's connected to a source of constant voltage, then you would use this equation, or whether the plates are isolated from any other place where the charges can go, that's a capacitor, just two plates on its own. In that case, you'd use this equation. So you want to think about those things, but really I'd like you to think whenever you're changing something about a capacitor in the capacitor factory, you're screwing up that capacitor, I want you to think about it as does it require the input of energy to do that change? Like if I'm separating the plates like this, whoosh, and they're isolated, is that going to be natural or is it going to be um, something that in which I have to do work? That's the question that you should ask yourself. <clears throat> Finally, Finally, I want to show you something beautiful and stunning. You know now that the energy stored in a capacitor is, well, didn't we say already that it's one half epsilon naught electric field squared times AD. Now guess what A times D is? Look at this capacitor over here. This capacitor has a D here and an area right there. Area times D is volume. So we can derive the existence of an energy density. And I'm gonna use a lowercase u for that. This is the energy density in a capacitor. That's the energy density in a capacitor. I'm just gonna divide by volume. Whoa, look, it's one half epsilon naught, or epsilon if we've got ourselves and a dielectric in there, times E square. Ding! Energy density depends on the square of the electric field. So fields store energy. Remember this, it's coming back again. This is a key result that we will revisit. Energy is stored in fields.